Welcome to Burlington's Candidate Forum. My name is Alan Foles and I'll be moderating the discussion. I'm joined by a press panel here to ask the questions of the candidates. Starting on my far right, please welcome Melissa Russell representing the Burlington Union Wicked Local, Chris Huffaker from the Burlington Patch, and Rich Hosford, B News Director here at BCAP. At this session, we focus on the school committee. We have four candidates for two open positions, two three-year positions. Stephen A. Nelson is the incumbent, and we have challengers Catherine A. Bond, Carl Foss, and Adam Sinesi. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. We'll begin with the ground rules. Here's how we will proceed. Each candidate will offer a one-minute opening statement, and we've drawn lots to, to uh, determine the order. By the way, we'll keep that same order for closing statements. After that, our press panel will ask questions of each of the candidates. Each candidate will have 90 seconds to, to answer. I'll try to give you a, a, a high sign when you have about 30 seconds left. We'll rotate between members of the press panel asking the questions as well as the candidates for first response. If the questioner has a follow-up after that, we'll allow that as well. Next, the candidates will each be allowed to ask one question of all of the other candidates, again with 90 seconds to respond. Finally, each candidate will give a two-minute closing statement. In the interest of covering as many subjects as possible, we'll keep a close watch on the time. So please frame your answers accordingly. If everyone's all set, we will begin. And let's see, by lot, we have decided that Mr. Senesi begins. You have uh, one minute. All right, so please let me start by saying thank you to BCAT, the local press, who's here to cover this this evening, my fellow candidates, and of course the viewers at home. Massachusetts is the home state of the legendary Horace Mann, and education is something that's in our state's DNA. Public education is important to me as it's played an important role in creating the man that I am today. I believe that the Burlington Public Schools offers an outstanding product and for our children who are the students of the future and who are our future. Um, really, the, the continuation of our country and our way of life and our town and all of these great things are dependent on these youngsters who are coming through the schools, and that should be important to all of us. I see that um, buildings and infrastructure are the biggest challenges our schools face in the next five to ten years, and I feel that my background, having served on town meeting and as vice chair of the Capital Budget Committee for the last five years, has uh, positioned me well with experience for this position. I have been on two building committees, including the fire station two, which is along the Middlesex Turnpike, as well as the Department of Recreation and- Can you wrap it up? Um, yes, um, so I just wanna say I've got two children. I, um, in addition to my town work, I do have a real job. I'm a BU grad, I've all, I'm also an autism dad, and I've also been the Fox Hill Mystery Reader. Thank you very much. Next, Mr. Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, good evening, fellow residents. Uh, my name is Steve Nelson, and I'm running for re-election uh, to the Burlington School Committee. Uh, I'm an actual graduate of the Burlington High School. I attended the high school the first year it was open, and uh, I've been involved in Burlington education pretty much ever since. Um, I'm running for re-election because I'm very passionate about education. Um, my uh, spouse is a teacher. Um, one of my sons is a teacher. And I believe that the most important thing that a community does is to educate its young children. I believe that I would make a good uh, re-election candidate because I have a great deal of experience serving on the committee. Prior to serving on the Burlington School Committee, I served on the Ways and Means Committee for three years. I was the chairman of the Education Subcommittee uh, that over overlooked all of the budgets uh, in the town. I was also the uh, Board of Selectmen's designee to the MBTA Advisory Board, and I, I wrote reports for the Board of Selectmen on the, uh, the meetings that we were having in Boston with the MBTA Board, and I also served uh, on uh, the uh, Beeline Advisory Committee. So I had a great deal of experience before I, I was elected to my first term as a school committee okay, member we're almost wrapped up. back in 1996, and I think that over the years my track record uh, establishes that I can continue to serve the community uh, well going into the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. And third, Ms. Bond. Hi, thank you, BCAT and uh, press and the moderator. I've lived in Burlington for 24 years, and my daughter is a recent graduate. I have a broad understanding of our schools K through 12. Professionally, I'm a principal logistics specialist with Raytheon. 
Currently and for the four past years, I've been on the BHS School Council, and as members, we have been working closely with the principal and guidance, reviewing the budget and changes in policy. We resolve concerns of parents and students, and we get really good communication back and forth. I want to continue to enhance the great reputations our schools have earned. My community involvement includes serving on the following boards of directors, BHSA, the Burlington Swim and Tennis Club, I'm the current treasurer of the Winchester Figure Skating Club and have been for the past 10 years. Other volunteering includes being a Pop Warner a cheer coach mom and we've won many national championships and I've also been a volunteer for the Burlington Education Foundation for the past 15 years. This involvement has strengthened my bond with many of the wonderful people, the children, and our outstanding teachers in the community. This invaluable, these invaluable connections really forged my decision to run for school committee. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Foss. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Melissa and Chris and Rich, for the questions and my fellow candidates for being here. I appreciate the opportunity to tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, there are really three main points I'd like to make today. The first is that I'm a father. I have uh, two children. My son is eight. He's in second grade. My daughter is, in kin is six and she's in kindergarten. Hello, Tommy and Callie. Um, and uh, so what that means is I have a real um, personal interest in ensuring that, they're, that we continue the success in making our schools in Burlington the uh, positive and productive places that we have uh, come to know. Um, the second part about me is that I'm a teacher. I have been an educator for 10 years and I'd like to give a shout out to all the students in room 20. I'm going to be showing you this tomorrow uh, or whenever we go back to school. But um, democracy in action is what I always say. Um, and so being an educator for 10 years I have the experience um, to hit the ground running and really support the students in, in the classrooms and to give um, a great deal of support to the teachers, administrators, and other staff at each of the schools in Burlington. Um, the, f the final point I'd like to make is that I am on town meeting and as a taxpayer. Um, in, in my role in town meeting, I have participated in the budget process and I'm familiar with the task of balancing the needs of the schools with the interests of the taxpayers in town. Um, I feel that the three aspects of my experience yeah, yeah. give me a, uh, a very strong voice and a fresh voice, something that can represent all the constituents uh, in town, and I will uh, represent all those voices in my role on the school committee. Thank you. Thank you very much. For the second round, we're going to give you a little bit more time. You've got 90 seconds. <laughs> I, uh, I'll try to mix up the first responders in each case, too, just to make it fair so it isn't always the same order, and the same with the, um, the questions. So the first question, we will begin with Melissa Russell, and the first one to answer it will be Steve Nelson. Ms. Russell. Well, candidates, um, in the interest of introducing you to the community, can you provide an example either from your professional life, or your personal life, where you've had to stand up and show strong leadership? I'm going first, Mr. Moderator? Yes, you are. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Well, I think I would like to focus on uh, my tenure on the school committee. When I first got on the school committee, the special education budget was part and parcel of the general education budget. And over the years, we would find that um, we would have unexpected uh, influx of students with special needs in town, and the budget would be frozen for regular education. So that was a real problem because freezing the regular education budget wasn't fair to the students and it created a great deal of tension. So one of the things that I advocated strongly for, uh, and we had to work with the Board of Selectmen and we had to work with Ways and Means to accomplish this, was to move the out-of-district placements for children with special needs into what we called the accommodated account. So we created a new account on the town side of the budget, not on the school side of the budget, so that when children came into the town uh, with serious needs that the, the local education couldn't meet, and they had to be placed out of district, the tuitions would be paid for out of the general uh, budget without having to put a freeze on the regular education budget. So that's one of the accomplishments that I'm, I'm most proud of. I really feel like we have to take care of all of our students and learners in the system, particularly children with special needs, and that's one of the best ways to do it. Thank you very much. Same question, Catherine Bond. So some of, uh, I'll go back to some of the experience I've had and some of the volunteering. Um, I really believe that our uh, children need, and especially our, our, our girls, um, have a problem with self-image every once in a while. 
And uh, one of the most recent um, ex examples of my having to step up and speak up for not only the parents' concerns, but also the students' concerns. Uh, my daughter was on the junior varsity cheerleading team on the soccer field along with all of her other cheerleaders. And they were wearing uniforms that were probably 20 years old, uh, which is fine. You know, we're all for saving money and, and all that kind of fun stuff. But um, the cheerleaders were feeling very uncomfortable in them. Most of them didn't fit. Their um, rear ends were hanging out. Um, it just wasn't appropriate. And a lot of the parents were noticing um, that as well. And so I decided that, you know, to advocate for the, the, the students and for their parents, uh, again, to help our, student, our, our kids feel better about themselves. So I went to the athletic department um, and then I uh, presented my case. I had showed them photos of the girls on the field, um, let them know that the girls were really feeling uncomfortable uh, in their skin, which you know doesn't help them. They already have enough uh, self-image problems as it is. And so as an end result for that, we were able to get new uniforms for all of the, uh, that, that group of cheerleaders. So I you know, really feel that you know, if I'm approached in this position, I'll take that same passion okay, um, to help you know, our students and our teachers. Thank you very much. Same question, uh, Mr. Foss. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, the example that comes to mind for me as far as being a, or showing uh, a sense of leadership is um, what I do every day. And I go to school and um, between the five classes that I teach, I have roughly 130 students in my classroom every day. And one of the things that you want to do as an educator, especially at the middle school level, is to provide a strong level of character education. And in that sense, you have to lead by example and in the way that you interact with each student in front of you, in the way that they observe you interact with other staff members, in the way that they um, observe you interact with their parents at meetings. These are all examples of how you want to um, lead by example and show that you want to uh, treat everyone with respect and um, put your best foot forward. And uh, more specifically, some of the curriculum that we teach in the social studies department in Lowell is um, also leading by example. And the phrase is, you want to be the change that you want to see in your community. And that is one of the reasons why I'm running is to show that if you want to make change in your community, you need to step up and get involved and um, get into the issues that matter to you. Um, one of the curriculum programs that we use is called Generation Citizen, and the, um, one of the aspects of that is to go into Boston, and uh, I took a select group of kids with me, and they get to see um, democracy in action. Thank you very much. And the same question, Mr. Senesi. Yeah, so my favorite example of leadership that I've been part of was, is actually one of my proudest accomplishments as a town meeting member. A few years back, we were having issues with the contamination of 1,4-dioxane at the, at, at the Vinebrook, uh, in the wells at Vinebrook, and there, we were having water shortages in town because that created the wells being shot, shut down. And, um, you know, there was a demand at the town meeting level for a solution. So w what we did was town meeting under the guidance of the moderator formed a committee to study the water issue. And we worked in conjunction with the selectmen to address the issue. And we looked at all of the facts. And originally, when we had gone into this process, what we called the water study committee, that consisted of some of the best meetings of town, uh, the best members of town meeting, including Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Bond's husband, Brad. And um, what we did is we looked at all of the facts and we came to an understanding of what was driving the consumption of water in Burlington. And we studied all of the different ways that we might be able to leverage the resources that we had. And at the time, the idea of going on MWRA was a really, it was a politically risky position for one. And it was really a politically unpopular position. But what our committee did is we came to we made sure we had a very inclusive process that included the entire community. We made sure that when our committee met that members of town were aware of it and we posted that the meetings would be on happening seconds. on social media. We conducted a, an entire educational process and seminars to build consensus across the community. 
And eventually, the measure to partially go on to MWRA passed town meeting overwhelmingly, despite at the prior being very unpopular. And I think people are happy with the outcome. Okay, we'll move on to our second question. This one will come from Chris Huffaker, and we will begin with uh, Catherine Bond. All right, so um, I think we all recognize that there are serious infrastructure building um, challenges facing the district over coming needs. So I think an important question is, how do you decide what to prioritize when looking at what schools, what buildings, where to look at advancing first, and where to look at trying to get state money? So, um, you know, I think that what we have to do is look to the experts who can come in and um, observe that. I think we need to talk to the principal of the school, the superintendent, and the teachers, because they're the ones who are living it every day. We also need to talk to the maintenance folks. I realize that we're having a major problem with the HVAC system in the high school, and you really have to prioritize what's going to um, affect, uh, you know, the teachers and the students, because if you have no heat, Clearly, you can't, uh, you know, come in the, to school in the winter time. Um, as far as looking at the high school and um, the science labs, we need to make sure that we get those updated so that we can take care of all of our students, um, whether they're AP students or not AP students, whatever they are. We need to make sure they have the right tools because we want to make sure they're prepared for when they go off to college. As far as the elementary schools are concerned, it's the same thing. We need to evaluate um, the overcrowding uh, at Fox Hill, of Fox Hill and some of the other infrastructure issues um, at, at uh, Pine Glen. And in terms of prioritizing, again, it's listening to the principals of the school and listening to the people who are living in those buildings every day and then prioritizing based on what we're hearing from each of those groups. Thank you. Same question, Adam Sinesi. All right, so the way that I see this is that at this point, w when the high school is having issues with the boilers and HVACs, when those go, they're, they're gonna go and we might as well just get them fixed now. Instead of slapping another Band-Aid on the problem, we should fund it in the immediate. Um, as far as the other infrastructure issues coming down the pipeline, that, you know, the elephant in the room is the Pine Glen and the Fox Hill with the incoming populations that are coming into the school system. And how do we address those? We just don't have the square footage to house the amount of students that are going to come into the system. So how do we prioritize that? Well, I'm going to look at it from three things. Um, first, well, I guess first, let me rewind. I, I definitely want to get the, the input from the experts, the teachers, the administrators that are in those buildings. I want to hear from the parents in those schools, for which I'm one of them. I have a child in the Fox Hill. But um, most importantly, I think we need to look at the quality of the, any project versus the cost. But number one is really monitoring the disruption to learning that could occur during a construction project. And my biggest concern is that um, any renovation to the Pine Glen facility, that it could not be done with the students currently in the building. There just isn't enough room on that property that abuts conservation land. That I see is a, 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 an About issue. Um, but again, anything, you know, we want to solicit as much state money as possible. We also have um, energy efficiency upgrades that we need to make as we're, we become a designated green community and we will get state funding for some of those. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, same question, Steve Nelson. Thank you. Um, the question was how do you prioritize? And I, I think that there's, it's a two-part answer to that question. Number one, when you're looking at overcrowding, you would think that that would be the number one priority. So we have to address the overcrowding in the schools. But then when you look at the high school, and as Mr. Sinesi said, if the boilers aren't functioning, you can't, you can't open the school. So. Right now, the school committee is kind of going on parallel paths. We're prioritizing the high school. We asked the state for six or seven years in a row to please fund a $70 million project. That $70 million project would have taken care of the HVAC, uh, the code requirements, and also the science labs, all in one fell swoop. We were rejected six or seven times in a row. So we finally realized that the state just is not going to approve the town of Burlington for that project. So now we have to potentially phase it in. We're looking at uh, doing the HVAC system maybe as phase one and asking town meeting to put that on their bonding schedule and then to do the science labs as phase two because there's only so much that bonding schedule can absorb in the town of Burlington. Then at the same time, we want to move forward with architectural studies for the, um, the Fox Hill program. We'd like to build a new school on the Fox Hill site. 
Uh, we believe that we can get state approval for a new building there, but it takes anywhere from six to eight years. I believe it was eight years for the Memorial School from the time we first started pushing for the funding till the time we actually started constructing the school itself. So we want to work on parallel uh, courses that are both important projects. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, Kyle Foss. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, the opponents have all made excellent points, and I'm going to echo them and uh, just add on a little bit. I do believe that you need to listen to all the different parties involved. Um, the, uh, Mr. Kuna and Mr. Conti, or Dr. Conti, um, they gave a list to the school committee just the other night at the school committee meeting, and they said, here are basically our wish list, and here's the things that we need to do right away. And so you want to listen to the administration and make sure that you are um, kind of echoing um, your support for uh, what, they, what their priorities are. But then you also have to listen to the principals at the school. And I had a meeting with Deb Dressler just the other day at Memorial, and she gave me a tour of that beautiful facility. You want to see that kind of uh, fantastic learning environment at um, each of the sites, if it's feasible, because um, as it was also mentioned, you want to listen to the um, architects and designers and, and decide what is actually possible at each site. But finally, you also want to listen to the parents because um, if you're in the Fox Hill District and there is a large school built on that site, they're worried about traffic issues and um, a very large school environment. You want to try to preserve the small school environment that we have. The four school model is something that I think that a lot of parents want to make sure that we continue in Burlington. So it's a very delicate process to try to make the um, decisions on what to do first. And again, we have applied for state funding for the high school for many years in a row, and it has never come through. Um, I know that the hope is that if we apply for funding for an elementary school, that the state will look at it differently. And um, you just have to make sure that the, um, the bottom line is equitable and uh, fair for everyone involved. Okay, thank you. We move on to our third question. This comes from Rich Hosford, and the, it'll first be directed to Cal Foss. Okay. Um, as the survey, the risk behavior survey always shows, you know, Burlington students, like students across the country, do engage in risky behaviors. Um, how do you believe that the school committee can help create a safe environment that encourages better habits and successful learning? Thank you, Rich. Um, first, I think that we should give the risk behavior survey more often. Um, as an educator, it is uh, surprising how fast things change in the schools and what the new risky behavior um, that students decide to engage in um, can change from year to year. So you don't want to make sure that you're um, working with the most up-to-date data. Um, the second thing that you want to do is um, make sure that you are encouraging the students and, and providing the survey in a way that they are comfortable and feel that they can be completely honest. And so it needs to be done in a way that they um, trust in the person that's asking them the questions. Um, that way you get a reliable result. Um, once you have the results, you need to look at them carefully and make sure that the programming that you recommend as a school committee um, is responsive to that. You can't just put in some sort of uh, blanket social, emotional, or risk uh, mitigation curriculum. It needs to be targeted toward what you see at the results of, or what you see from the results of those surveys. Um, I think that Burlington does a good okay, job sounds. in responding to what the students' needs are. I just make I want to make sure that it is done in a targeted and effective way. Thank you. Uh, Steve, the same question. Thank you. Yeah, the, the Youth Risk Behavior Survey has been a survey that we've done probably for eight or nine years now. Every other year the survey is conducted. And the results of that survey to me have always been very, very alarming. And I think it, it, it focuses in on the fact that we don't actually, I think, as parents understand the, uh, the level of insecurity that uh, our students uh, are undergoing during the course of their high school experience. Uh, when you see statistics where, you know, 24% of the students 
that answer the survey indicate that they feel sad or depressed for a two-week period in a row or longer, um, it's alarming. And when you see that 12 or 13 percent of students in the Middlesex County area have prepared a plan for suicide, you realize that the emotional well-being of our students is something that we really have to focus on. We added last year, we added an adjustment counselor to the Burlington High School to hopefully address that. Uh, I'd like to see another adjustment counselor added this year into our budget uh, because that's what we need to do. Is we need to support uh, students that are, that are struggling. We need to identify the ones that are struggling and, and get to them early and, and make sure that we provide the services that they need. We have a wellness committee in Burlington and in the high school um, um, director uh, of health and education is part of that wellness committee along with other community members and they had a, a oh, recent summary and they made 12 recommendations and a lot of it was education of teachers, education of parents, and education of students about the, the significance of the problem and how to address it. Thank you. Adam. Yeah, so I think we, you know, it's on us to continuously take a multi-pronged approach. Part of that approach is the curriculum in the classrooms, you know, whether it's the health classes and, you know, we always need to recalibrate the curriculum to make sure we're addressing the, the next issue coming down the pipeline because the things that, um, the, 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 today's problems are, you know, the problems that we're seeing today aren't going to be the same problems that we're seeing tomorrow. I think, you know, a good athletics program like we have at the high school that does not require, you know, um, additional payments from the families. I, I think that keeping, keeping the students busy is an important thing to keeping people out of trouble. I think working closely with the, um, you know, the local youth and family services in the town to provide a coordinated approach for some of the students that are at risk. But one area that I think that we can we need to address is we, we all recognize the importance of technology in our curriculum but there are there are a lot of studies coming uh, coming down the pipeline and mr nelson had implied the depression within youth and they're linking screen time to the students are spending on their you know laptops and ipads to depression and i don't know if it's an issue of people seeing that their friends are doing things and they have a case of fomo fear of missing out but um, this is clearly an issue that, you, you know, as I said, we should always be recalibrating curriculum. We may want to take a look at how people are using their, how they're using technology and if we should be maybe not using it less, but using it smarter. Thank you. And finally, Catherine. Yes, yeah, so um, as far as a safe environment um, uh, with the, the testing that's been going on, I, I'm going to mirror a lot of what he said, <laughs> some of the words right out of my mouth. Um, about a third of our students are um, feeling sad and depressed um, for a two-week period of time, and that's really scary to, to me as a parent. Um, I, I, you know, I want to make sure that our, our teachers and the students are giving the proper information um, whether that's uh, through pamphlets or through the counselors, guidance counselors uh, in the school providing information. Um, bring in mentors if we can. Um, I'm sure we can bring in speakers um, without cost to the, um, to the school. I actually know someone that I went to uh, high school with who actually played for the Red Stocks that I was trying to bring in a couple years ago. He actually had a son who committed suicide, uh, very unexpected, and I wanted to bring him in and talk about his program. Uh, called the I Love You Man program and how the uh, friends from your high school actually when his son uh, committed suicide um, he found that it was the high school friends that came back and supported him the most and I think that you know if we can bring in the right tools educate our students on the when they have risky behavior ag again if they're feeling suicidal or um, or students are um, you know drinking alcohol or you know trying to t test the water with vaping and drugs that if you teach them well, how it affects sense. their body um, how it affects their family um, it really if they can bring it home and see it and, and, and experience from people who've been through it I think it will help them out a good deal thank you very much for the next question we return to Melissa Russell um, candidates nobody runs for an office in order to maintain the status quo so what do you see that could be improved on the school committee and how are you the person to make that happen and we'll begin with Adam all right so 
I believe that I've been, I've served on town meeting for several years and I've um, always believed that we can sort of govern by consensus and try and move opinion. And I believe that th that is always done with the best communication possible. And I do think that there is room for the current school committee to improve some of their communications with the other bodies in town, you know, particularly ta town meeting, obviously. And I would think the selectmen creating a bonding schedule for the next 10 years, getting them on the same page with some of the infrastructure issues that we're looking to improve. I, you know, I found it a little bit disappointing a couple of years ago when there was a budget shortfall that the default position was to sort of dig heels in and um, resist change and looking at new ways to do, to fix the accounting practices that were happening. I, I understand why the budget shortfall happened. It was disappointing that it wasn't known about until after the fact. Um, I felt like there was reluctance to bring on a, a business administrator as they've brought on. And um, I don't understand why it had to take so many meetings and why there was a defensive crouch when I really felt like there was a lot of room to get out in front of the issue. And just by better communication. And I, I hope to bring better communication and transparency and inclusiveness. Oh, 10 seconds. That, I'm done. Oh, good. <laughs> All right, uh, same question, uh, Carl. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, even a fantastic school system still has some students that fall through the, gra through the gaps. And um, what I would like to take a look mm -hmm. at as a school committee member is how we can close those gaps and make sure that we are fully meeting the needs of all students those that have a diagnosed disability, um, they, the services that the special educators provide uh, for the most part is good mm -hmm. and there are certainly improvements to be made here and there, but um, what I'm concerned about is stuff that is not as um, obvious. And the school does a good job with their RTI program, um, but I think that it could be strengthened and that the um, services that are provided to students that don't have a diagnosed disability um, could be um, strengthened as well. And when we look at things like the um, ability to read at grade level, there are, if you look at the data, there are some spots where um, we could make improvements. When you look at the statistics on um, reading levels by gender, especially as they get into middle school and high school, um, I think with a few small oh, tweaks seconds. that we can um, make improvements there as well. Um, yeah, I think that we do a good job, but we can make improvements. Great, thank you. And let's see, uh, where are we? Next up is Catherine. Okay, so, um, you know, as far as change, um, some of the, I actually was having a conversation uh, at an event recently with somebody whose child was just diagnosed with autism. And um, I personally, you know, have not experienced that. But one question I had is if you're not from here, you don't know anyone uh, from the Burlington area, how do you know who to go to and how do you get acclimated? Um, in terms of what to expect when you're entering that elementary school level. I know there are all kinds of um, people who are, are, are there to assist, but you know, is there a transition? Is there some sort of a, a, a parent group um, that is formed to really sit down and, and educate those people? And it seemed to me from talking to this person who's from out of town, um, yes, she had, you know, there are 10 groups of people who are coming at you, but when it comes to just getting the basic information for when you're starting into the elementary school, maybe we need to find a way to smooth that over a little bit better. Uh, something else, at least from uh, the, the high school level, um, I really feel like we need to try and put some sort of policy in place or something in the student handbook so students understand uh, homework deadlines. When we went to school, you know, your homework was due the next day when you showed up in class. You know, I see homework being due over the weekend at midnight. At midnight, you know, are we encouraging our kids to stay up past midnight when we already know they lack sleep? So I just want to make sure that we're looking at these things, oh, um, uh, you know, through the, the, the school committee and addressing them um, ac accordingly. 
Thank you. And see, finally, Stephen. Thank you. I think there's two different things that I'd like to um, emphasize in terms of change going forward. First of all, we have building needs, and I think that um, we need to address those. And that's one of the reasons I'm running for school committee, because I think I've got a lot of experience working with um, uh, improving the schools. Uh, I was on the building committee that uh, recommended to the school committee to take back the Francis Wyman. The Francis Wyman School was rented out to Northeastern University and then uh, the um, training council for the deputy sheriff's office. And we decided to take back that school, renovate it completely and turn it into an elementary school. And then as a school committee person, I've been um, on the committees that have made the decision to uh, rehabilitate and add on to the Marshall Simons Middle School. That project came out very well. We got uh, state funding. Uh, the Memorial School building, I was a part of that uh, committee that worked on that project for many, many years. Uh, I think we built that building under budget. It was under $30 million, and the state <laughs> paid 52%. So I think that, uh, that that's one of the areas of change, is getting our, uh, keeping our facilities up to speed. The other thing, we had a bunch of uh, elementary teachers appear before us, and we've also had high school and middle school uh, principals appear before us, and they've all told us about the need for staffing. They want to increase the staffing levels because they have needs in the special education area, instructional assistant areas, okay, and same. also as in math tutoring. So you, you need a strong advocate to make sure that we get the funding that's necessary to implement those changes and keep our programs as best as good as they can be. Thank you. The next question we return to Chris Huffaker. And just to let you know we'll begin with Steve Nelson again. Chris? Okay. Thank you. Um, so candidates, the uh, Burlington's uh, state accountability report for 2019 showed that the uh, district was making uh, substantial progress towards targets, and that partly reflected um, strong performance on the MCAS relative to the state, relative to past years. But that was not evenly distributed. There are some groups, um, you know, economically disadvantaged students, high need students, students with disabilities, that in certain tests declined or otherwise were not um, you know, making the sort of progress uh, you might hope to see. What do you see as your role on the school committee in um, putting forward policies or advocating to, uh, to help those students um, uh, succeed academically? And we begin with Mr. Nelson. I think we've touched on some of those things. We want to make sure that we have adequate staffing mm -hmm. to um, help. We need some one-on-one -on -one instruction with some, uh, some students with special needs. And if we're doing an inclusion model where you have students with special needs in the classroom, which I think is the best model, you might have two or three students, and there might only be one instructional assistant working one-on-one -on -one with one of them, and the other two don't have enough support. So we have to make sure that we get additional support. And there's only so many teachers that we can add from year to year because we're, we have some restrictions from, from the town side on, on how much they can afford to, to pay, and, and we would like to have them all in one year. We have 22 new positions proposed in our budget this year. And if we get three or four of those new positions, we'll be happy. And I'll, I, I have to say we're probably every one of the new positions is going to be in special education area except for a nurse. And the nurse takes care of such vital needs. So um, I think that that's the area that I would focus on when you're looking at, at groups that aren't making the progress that, you, that you'd like to see. Thank you. Next up is Ms. Bond. <laughs> so again, I hear some of what you were saying. Um, you know, that we uh, need to make sure that we're getting the one-on-one -on -one staffing we're needed. Um, if we see that there is a way to combine, uh, you know, several students together with one person, um, I think that helps them with, um, again, feeling in, in included in the classroom um, uh, environment. I also know that at the elementary school level, we are doing the response to intervention. And um, that's uh, targeting students who have, um, you know, some sort of a deficit uh, in terms of uh, their learning uh, with reading and math. Um, they're grouped um, on their ability, and they're, it's a very fluid movement where they're moving up and down. And we need to continue those programs to make sure that our students don't fall behind. And maybe we can look into doing something that, like that or a similar program um, at the middle school level. Um, you know, if there's something uh, that could mirror that program, uh, and then also at the high school level. Thank you, Mr. Foss. The same question. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Chris. Um, I think that in order to continue with Burlington's success in making progress toward our targets, um, it needs to come down on a more granular level and 
one of the things that we do in the classrooms is ongoing um, formative assessments and that is checking in uh, frequently on where students are, what their abilities are, and what their needs are. Um, and uh, what you do with that data as a result of those formative assessments is you um, provide targeted interventions on the deficits that the students have. Um, Catherine mentioned RTI and that is a strong program um, but I think that um, Burlington could do more. Um, I think that um, if a student is targeted using RTI and they are not making progress, maybe you need to move forward um, and uh, provide a stronger intervention. Um, we need to educate parents more on what RTI is. I don't think a lot of parents um, are not as knowledgeable as they should be about what the program is and what the results should be if their student is not making progress. They can advocate for their child. Um, teachers are very okay, strong advocates for, chi for the children in schools and um, as a result of that advocacy we can make uh, even more progress toward meeting our goals. Thank you and finally the same question Mr. Sinesi. So this is an issue that's really important to me as I am the father of a child with autism and I think Burlington did a very good job by him and staffing was very important. Staffing is very important, remains important. I think that inclusion is important as Steve had implied that trying to keep the children with special needs around um, neurotypical children will help them integrate into society better as they, as they grow up. I also think that Burlington has become an increasingly diverse community where English is not always the first language that's spoken at home. So we need to offer support to it in enrichment programs to a lot of the students to add to the experiences that they're getting into the classroom. We need to be able to target who those students are and make sure that we're communicating with the parents and always, you know, I definitely think parental involvement is key on every level regardless of the student's academic performance level. So making sure that the parents are included as partners. Thank you. Well, I think we have time for one more question during this round, and for that, we'll return to Rich Hosford. Mr. Hosford. Thank you. Um, I think it's pretty well agreed upon that Burlington has good schools, um, but, you know, things can always get even better. So, uh, sort of uh, the opposite of Melissa's last question, what do you think the school department is doing well, and what ideas do you have to build upon that? And we'll begin with Catherine. So um, again, you'd mentioned the schools are excellent. Um, I think what you know, speaks very highly uh, for our, our school system is that a lot of other school systems look to Burlington uh, in terms of our leadership and technology. Um, you know, we were one of the first schools to implement um, iPads as far as being able to indiv individualize um, you know, our teaching to our students and to give our teachers a little bit of freedom in terms of the, um, what they're presenting to the students in terms of what they can learn. Um, I think that, um, you know, that, that Dr. Conti's done a really good job, um, you know, in terms of, you know, trying to, uh, he, you know, uh, as far as, you know, he's an award-winning superintendent. And again, I think that a lot of school systems are trying to mirror what we're doing. Um, so at this point, you know, like that's what I'm saying. <laughs> okay, thank you. Same question, Adam. So I, two things in particular that I think Burlington does a great job at. Obviously, I believe that science, technology, engineering, and math are the wave of the future. They're the wave of the present. That's where our children are going to be. Those are the areas that, are, that will, are, will make employable people in the world as we, uh, as we send them out beyond graduation. And I think Burlington has an awards-winning robotics program. And, uh, you know, I know I'm a f very familiar with the science program, and I think we do a very good job focusing on those areas. Another area that I think Burlington does a good job is the, is the parent of a child with special needs, but I do believe that there is always level for improvement, room for improvement, is in special needs. Um, and one thing that, one signature that I would like to put on any um, school committee that I was part of is, you know, making sure as we look to building new buildings that we're, including the Disabilities Access Commission, that we're including everyone that, uh, including parents too in the various school districts and the teachers, 
But um, I definitely want to make sure that we're in extremely mindful of making sure that all children, including those in wheelchairs, have access to the playgrounds. Um, I, I am very proud of you know supporting rubberized surfacing at the Pine Glen, where our special needs population in Burlington at the elementary level typically goes to elementary oh, school. Seconds. Um, I supported the rubberization of the surfacing there as a town meeting member. A lot of people didn't understand why that was necessary, but obviously I'm woke to the needs of the special needs community, having lived it every day of my life at this point. But um, I, I definitely want to make this as inclusive so the special needs community feels like they're being advocated for at every level. And, I, and I, I'm, that's not a criticism because at this point they are. I, I, just, I will be one more set of eyes in that role. Okay, same question, Steve. Thank you. Well, I don't want to sound like we're bragging when you ask the, what, we, what do we think we're doing very well. I think Mr. Sinesi listed a number of things as well as uh, uh, Ms. Bond about what we're doing well. Um, every year when I, we're presented with our budgets, there's a need to add staffing. And there's always a pushback because the, the general consensus on the town side of government is that they want to maintain level staffing unless you can justify the need. And sometimes there's a lot of surprise when they see the school committee budget and where we've got principals suggesting we need you know, 20 or 22 additional staffing. We can never, of course, afford that within one, one budget. But I think that perhaps we can do a better job giving more notice to the town about what our needs are and articulating those needs in a better way rather than doing it in you know February and March when we're going through the budget I think it would be helpful if we could articulate those needs in September and have conversations throughout the winter and then in, uh, throughout the, the fall and into the winter about why we need more funding to meet the needs because they set guidelines in Burlington usually in the fall and the guidelines are based upon how much they think the, the, the tax levy uh, can, can be supported by commercial and residential property taxes. But sometimes we, and we've done it, we've done it this year and we didn't do it as aggressively last year, but sometimes we'll oh, tell, say you need a th you're only gonna get 3% this year and we'll tell them it's impossible. You gotta give us 3.75 or you gotta give us four and a half. I think we need to do a better job getting, it, getting on top of that need earlier in the budget season. Thank you. And finally, Carl. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thanks for the question, Rich. Um, I think you're right that Burlington does do a great job in a lot of areas. And um, one thing that I think that Burlington does particularly well, and uh, well, let me, re let me back up for a second. Uh, when I'm in the classroom, a lot of times I get questions, oh, Mr. Foss, why do we have to learn this? What is this? How is this going to help us? And what I think Burlington does well is showing students what the things they're learning in the classroom, how they're going to help them, and especially bringing in businesses and allowing students to go out to different businesses. The um, high school internship program, I think, is fantastic and allows students to get that real world experience. I know that the middle school, they have had um, local business leaders come in and present to different classrooms. I think that's fantastic. I really, um, I love the way that Dr. Conti and the administration has been um, innovative in allowing um, that school business relationship to thrive and um, I would like to see that continue um, and and be strengthened we have a lot of businesses um, and they allow the taxpayers to be very generous in providing all the resources that we have in Burlington and I think that um, that's something that we do well but that we could um, continue to grow and and get the kids the uh, real-world experience that's going to um, benefit them when they get beyond high school. Thank you very much. Well, for this next round, each of you gets to ask all of the other candidates one question. Again, you'll have 90 seconds to answer. We'll begin. The first question will be from Mr. Nelson. Thank you. Well, two of the questions I've written out have already been asked. So <laughs> on, on the fly, I'm going to ask this one. Um, are there any uh, policies or procedures of the school committee that you think are uh, inadequate and that as a school committee member you would uh, propose changing? And we'll begin with Ms. Bond. <laughs> I think I kind of mentioned one of them and, and I'm not sure if it's 
uh, more of a policy for the school committee to put in place in, in writing and as a policy or something to go into the handbook for the students. But again, um, one of my you know, pet peeves when my daughter was uh, going through uh, middle school and um, high school was uh, how homework was uh, given to the students. Um, there were some issues while she was in school where homework wasn't assigned till 7 or 7.30 at night. Well, when you have after school activities, you think that you have all your homework done or you know you've planned ahead um, in terms of you know, what homework you have to do and then you're expected to keep checking every you know, half hour, or hour, whatever it is to make sure that you have all your homework done to hand it in either at midnight or whatever time. So one of the things I'd like to evaluate uh, in more detail and see again if it should be a policy or something more put into the handbook for the students is um, you know, having a, a something solid in writing uh, for the teachers so they put, you know, know that they have to have the homework either assigned when the students come out of class, like when I was in school, or by 3.30 in the afternoon, something so that everybody knows what the rules are. Uh, I'm not, you know, again, I'd prefer if students had uh, were able to hand their homework in uh, when they come into class the next day or whenever their next class is. Um, that's what we had. That, that way you weren't worried about staying up all night trying to do it. Some kids get up early in the morning. They're able to do their homework in the morning. I just want to have the flexibility because right seconds. now our students are so stressed. I mean, that's part of the stress. The stress is from, uh, you know, uh, outside influences. But if they, you know, had the time to, to really um, and understand, you know, when their homework is, what it is, in a timely manner, then I think that would make a big difference. Thank you. Next we turn to Mr. Foss. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, great question, Steve. Thank you. Um, one thing that I would love to um, see the school committee do is um, actively encourage more civic participation. Um, I know that the, the minutes are set on the, uh, or released on the town website. I mean, I'm sorry, the agenda is released on the town website, um, especially in the 21st century with the um, ease of social media. I think that those agendas could be spread further and more people could be made aware of what the committee might be um, uh, discussing that night at the meeting. Uh, or the, I know they released it a couple of days ahead, but um, it seems like there is only good attendance at meetings when there's some sort of hot button issue. And I would love to see more people involved. That way you get people at the meeting who can ask questions there rather than complain about it later on Facebook. And um, I think if the school committee was more proactive about encouraging people to go there, and this is a little bit of the civics teacher in me trying to say to get more people involved to um, promote that civic engagement, um, I think that the citizens and the school committee would benefit. It would be a um, a better relationship and I think that's one way that the school committee could encourage people to get involved. Thank you. Mr. Sinesi. I'm going to expand on what Carl said and, and it sort of harkens back to something that Steve had said earlier. Um, it, you know when it comes to the budgets I, I think greater communication it's something I discussed earlier in this debate it, but I think greater communication goes a long way building bridges or better more sturdy bridges with town meeting with the board of selectmen I, you know, I thought Steve had a great idea when he said, you know, including people in the budget process earlier in the process. And I hope to join you in school committee and be a partner in that realm. Um, I do think that there is always room from a curriculum standpoint to recalibrate the curriculum. You know, again, science, technology, engineering, and math. Those are four important areas. And I think that by virtue of what they are, science and technology. We always need to be taking a look to see where we are and whether we're up to date. Um, I think we should be assess assessing on a more continuous and ongoing basis what is success with relation to teaching technology in the classroom. How are we assessing the iPad program? And what does it mean to succeed w with that program? And um, again, I think it would just be modernizing some of the practices, uh, you know, when, when the budget shortfall happened a couple of years ago and we didn't realize until the fiscal year ended that there was a budget shortfall because the About 10 we were working off of antiquated accounting policies. I don't know as, as a member, who, as someone who's not a member of the school committee at this point, where the next shoe could fall, but we just need to always be looking to modernize our infrastructure practices 
on the on the business end of the schools. Thank you. The next question, we turn to Ms. Bond. So my question is, um, what role do you believe technology should play in the classroom, and how do you balance that with the current recommendations to limit screen time for kids, um, even teenagers? And we begin with Mr. Sinesi. So I think we should be incorporating technology in the classroom to the, to the greatest of ability, and I think we should be doing it by you know, applying practical, real-world situations at the high school level. At the, at the elementary and middle school level, I think there's room to incorporate some of the everyday, um, the everyday curriculum by using the iPads to get the students excited about who are visual learners to possibly learn in a different way and to use it for educational games that ideally they'll be learning something from, but they'll be also ha having fun with. Um, and I think the, the screen time sort of harkens back to what Mrs. Bond had said earlier. I think sending the students home with homework that relies on them to utilize more screen time, it, it might be best for us as a school system to cap the education with relation to technology during the school day. Thank you. Mr. Foss, same question. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, that's a great question, Catherine. Thank you. Um, I believe that there is a role for technology in the classroom, and I am appreciative of the um, access that students have because of the, the leadership that Burlington has shown in this realm. I do agree with you that it is concerning because there are a lot of studies on brain development and the um, uh, dangers of too much screen time. Um, I, when I was talking to Dr. Conti the other day, we did discuss this idea, and one of the things that he said was um, it isn't, isn't new for kids anymore. The, a lot of them have these iPads at home, and when they're given a choice, a lot of them run to the alternative. They might, if it's uh, an after school program, they might go and play instead of using the iPads. If it's in class and it's a younger classroom, they might use blocks or they might choose something else. And the other thing that he mentioned is that teachers are getting better at using them in a targeted approach. I think in a lot of cases they're um, um, finally they're getting the proper training and, and in some cases they were the iPads were just rolled out and the teachers were just giving them and saying figure it out now they have proper training there and that's very important to make sure that they're used in the proper way and in I do believe that it should be in a limited fashion thank you thank you uh, Mr. Nelson thank you um, I agree with what Mr. Foss has just, has just articulated and I think it depends on what grade level we're talking about. I think that at the high school level, I think the use of iPads and technology is, is very important um, because when our students graduate, that they're going to be living in that world. And I think that they're a little bit more capable of perhaps regulating uh, the amount of time that they're using it. At the middle school level, uh, I think it improves the delivery of um, instruction. I think a lot of the middle school teachers enjoy using iPads and using technology to develop lessons and it engages the students more when they're doing that. Uh, we do have to be careful about the extent to which we do it, but it's, it's Burlington was one of the first uh, districts to have one-on-one -on -one iPads and uh, most of the communities in Massachusetts, if not all of them, have done it. I don't know if they all do it K to 12 or one, 1 to 12, but uh, most of them are doing it. And they kind of followed, the, I think, the lead of Burlington. At the elementary level, uh, I mean, I've talked, to, I've talked to teachers who feel like there's not enough old-fashioned writing on real paper and not doing everything on iPads for kids. It doesn't necessarily develop uh, their their hand-eye coordination and their writing abilities. And uh, so I think if we're going to talk about using iPads and technology less, it would be more, in my view, more for the elementary level. Kids, they're getting it when they go home. They're getting it uh, seconds. all, you know, too much of the time. And I agree with Catherine, the premise of Catherine's uh, question that uh, we do have to limit it. And I think that would be an important area to do it. Thank you. Okay, our next question, we turn to Mr. Foss. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, we have mentioned RTI several times over the course of this discussion. 
I'm just curious what uh, the other candidates' thoughts are on the RTI services that we provide in Burlington. Are they used properly in our schools for students with or without a diagnosed disability? And we start with Mr. Nelson. Thank you. Excellent question. I was going to ask it myself. Uh, actually, response to intervention, and I agree with something that Mr. Foss said earlier, uh, I, I think there are a lot of parents out there who don't really understand what it is. Um, but it was brought on by Dr. Conti. It was something that was used in the district where he was an assistant superintendent for curriculum and instruction before he came to Burlington. And he felt that it was imperative that Burlington start assessing the needs of elementary students earlier in the process. And so he came up with this, uh, really come up with it. He, he asked the uh, teachers to buy into this RTI program where we try to assess um, elementary students even as early as kindergarten. We try to assess them uh, early. They take three tests a year um, or three assessments a year and based upon the results of those assessments we try to target the instruction that they need in order to get them at grade level and above grade level. So that's what RTI is and when they say it's a, it's a response that's the targeting to intervention. So I think it's, a, it's an excellent program I think the program does require a lot of support, and I've said this uh, all night. I said, that, you know, we need uh, instructional assistants and, and tutors. And one of the things that Mr. Sinesi mentioned earlier was the fact that we had a budget overrun. One of the reasons we had that budget overrun was because we, ten seconds. we overran the, the instructional assistants and the tutor budget. It was for a good reason, but it wasn't properly monitored, and, and I agree, and we've improved that. Uh, but I think that RTI is, is a great program, and I'd like to see it continue. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Sinesi. So as a parent, I've, I guess I will say I have benefited from this program because as I've said before that I have a son with autism and he came into the Burlington school system and he was in the Burlington Early Childhood <laughs> Center. And obviously from the assessments that were done, um, he was, you know, the special needs professionals in the Burlington Public Schools, they, they attempted their best to tailor a curriculum around him. Um, it, it eventually resulted in him getting an out-of-district placement, which is, which is proper for him. He, he would require too much attention inside the Burlington Public Schools. But um, as a school committee member, I would defer to the professionals on this issue, and that would be my management style. I am not a professional educator. I come from the business world. Um, but what my management style would be, would be to ask questions to the professionals, ask them to defend their positions, hear alternative points of view, do a little bit of my own homework and, you know, make a judgment from there or empower the professionals to make their own judgments. That would be my style to approach this. Um, so thank you. And finally, on this question, Ms. Bond. Yes, I did talk to talk about it a little bit, and um, you know I agree uh, that with what you all have communicated that um, I think the teachers understand what it's used for. Um, that maybe some of the parents need to um, get a better understanding of what it's doing for their 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 children. Um, you know, again, it, it's it, the testing does occur three times a year, like you had mentioned, and you know I think um, I'll also agree with you that you know we need to. Um, to talk to the teachers and see if that is often enough. Um, even though it's fluid where the students are moving back and forth based on um, you know, their abilities as they uh, move forward in math or are right at the level where they should be or they need more help, the kids are constantly moving around and I think that's great. And they don't have any kind of um, stigma attached to it either. You know, you're just grouped as you're grouped and you're moving along and you know, I think that that's really good because it's helping the kids not you know, feel good about them, you know, they feel good about themselves. Um, the other thing that the program does is it's measuring the effectiveness of the curriculum. And um, you know, I think that, again, we need to continue to get that feedback um, so, again, we can help our teachers do what they need to do to make sure our students are getting the best that they possibly can uh, so that as the kids move on to the next grade, they're better prepared. Um, again, I think overall it's a great program, um, and we need to just continue to evaluate that and see um, if it continues to work for us and if there's anything else that we can change um, through suggestions from parents or um, looking at other programs that might be um, different out there that would be better then we need to continue to do that. Thank you. Okay, our last question will come from Adam. All right, so 
you know, recently I've been to a few school committee meetings and that, before I was a candidate because I, I, I applaud the school committee for, um, you know, encouraging participation on the new, the potential new Pine Glen, new Fox Hill. So I attended that meeting and I've gone to other meetings in the past. So my question is, when was the last time any one of you showed up to a political meeting in town, not as a candidate, but because it was an issue that you cared about? And what was that issue? And we'll begin with Kyle. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Great question, Adam. Um, the school committee meeting last year when the um, discussion of the population growth and what to do with the um, elementary schools and the plans, the, the, the administration was discussing four different plans. That was the meeting I was going to go to unless my wife hadn't decided that she wanted to go. So she went and uh, I stayed home with the kids that night, otherwise I would have been there. Um, other political meetings that I've been to include um, all the town meetings, I have perfect attendance on town meeting. And uh, um, besides that, it's just um, school meetings, but um, yeah, thank you. Okay, same question, Catherine. Well, <laughs> again, I um, typically, again, because I'm working full time as you do, um, I watch them on BCAT as often as I can. I haven't had to really express my voice because, again, my husband is there. And if I have any issues or um, questions, um, you know, the same thing, it's not worth both of us going. He can express what I have exp asked him to, to uh, ask questions about. Um, I can tell you, though, that uh, my, you know, my first experience, though, with uh, attending um, a, a town meeting or a school committee meeting was before my daughter even started school. And it was because I had a question in regards to the cutoff uh, for kids starting kindergarten. And again, I had no perspective on who to talk to, what to do. Uh, my daughter was an October child. Um, the cutoff was in, um, in August. I knew the state law was December. She had already done uh, kindergarten and private, uh, private kindergarten, and I wasn't sure if uh, she was going to be bored doing kindergarten again. And so, you know, I stumbled, you know, not being from Burlington, on, you know, how to attend a school committee meeting. And, um, and I asked my question, and I have to admit, you know, the, the school committee answered my questions uh, appropriately. They pulled me aside after uh, we met and explained things, you know, even better to me. And then I was able to make a better decision in terms of what I wanted to do with my daughter. So I've continued uh, to stay involved that way and being, you know, again, I haven't necessarily, you know, had to Ten go seconds. to those meetings, but uh, I can tell you that I'm, I'm very involved. And finally, uh, Steve. That's an interesting question. Um, I attended a town meeting when the Burlington School Department had, had no uh, issues before the town meeting, but the, the subject was the unfunded liability um, and how the town was going to deal with it. The town had received a report from accountants and the, um, the numbers were all over the place and there was a great deal of debate uh, that night about how, how much should the town invest in trying to take care of the unfunded liability for the retirees. But when you're on the school committee, you, you know, we, go to, we have two meetings a month. We have subcommittee meetings constantly. Uh, I'm on the Ways and Means subcommittee. I'm on a bunch of PTO subcommittees. So I'm at meetings all the time. Um, we had a Ways and Means subcommittee meeting last week. We have another Ways and Means subcommittee meeting next week. We've got three school committee meetings this month. Uh, we present uh, to all of the town meetings except usually the January town meeting. Uh, so I would probably say I've Ten, at least 50 meetings a year being in this position. So uh, if there's something really important, I'll, I'll, I'll go. But usually I just don't, I don't have much more time to devote to, to public meetings. And if there's something significant, oftentimes I'll, I'll pick up the phone and call one of the selectmen or, or one of the members. Thank you very much. This brings us to the last segment of the evening, closing statements. And as I said earlier, we'll try to keep, we'll, we'll keep the same order as we started with the opening statements. So that means that Mr. Sinesi, you begin. All right. So I believe that, you know, regardless of what happens in this race, there is going to be a new member of the school committee. And I think I bring the most experience of the candidates on the stage. Um, as I have, um, I've participated in 
capital budget, um, two building committees, and it, obviously buildings are the biggest challenge that's coming through the pipeline for us. Again, I've been on MWRA committee or the water study committee where we've looked at, uh, you know, we've, we've show, I've shown through example, the leadership style that is a um, consensus building process with that it is, involves communication. Um, other committees I've been on include the sidewalk committee, the, um, I've been a PCAT volunteer and a people helping people volunteer. So I'm out in the community. Um, I believe that I would bring the perspective of a parent as a parent of a child in the system who was at the Fox Hill School, who was a neurotypical child. I also bring the sensitivity of a parent who has a child with autism who is out of district. Um, so I see things through a lot of different vantage points. Um, I've had a history of taking votes that have mattered at town meeting, like rubberized playground surfaces at the Pine Glen School, a museum elevator so that uh, the Pine Glen School could have their annual field trip to the Burlington Town Museum. And I've supported handicap spaces at the high school um, or increased handicap spaces at the high school as a member of town meeting. Um, my background in business has um, required me to manage budgets, which I think is a skill set that I could bring to the school committee. I would have no conflicts of interest in having to negotiate a contract as I, I don't have anyone that works in the system related to me. I'm not a teacher. Um, I've actually carried a union card for a lot of years, so I understand the give and take that is a contract negotiation and that you need to leave all parties feeling like they've, um, th that they've achieved an equitable deal and a fair deal. Um, one other area and one last area that I'll lead you with is that, you know, actually a couple of different areas. Um, my, the theme of my campaign is building the future. And I believe that there's three prongs to that. It's phys the physical buildings and infrastructure in the Burlington Public Schools. It's planning with curriculums that involve science, technology, engineering, and math, and recalibrating those curriculums to teach to a successful future for our students. And lastly, I think it's time that um, we formed a generational bridge. Our, it's time for our generation to really step up and elect one of our own to the school committee. We can't continue we, we, we value experience in Burlington, and I applaud the existing school committee for their experience. But we've got a school committee that is, they're, they're aging. We can't expect them to do this for another five or 10 years, or we're gonna end up with a seconds. school committee that doesn't have a lot of experience. I believe I have experience now to serve in this role, and I believe I could be that bridge to the next generation, and I hope to mentor those who come up behind me. And I look forward to the possibility of working with those who have experience in the meantime. Thank you. Thank you. Final comments, Stephen Nelson. I want to thank you all uh, at home uh, for watching the debate this evening. I want to thank BCAT for hosting us and the press for their uh, insightful questions and, and Mr. Moderator uh, for moderating this, uh, this event this evening. Um, I hope all of the voters in, in Burlington will go out on April 4th and cast a vote. And, and I'm asking you to kindly cast one of your votes uh, for me. Uh, I think that I'm the most qualified candidate on the dais. I've got over 20 years of experience serving as a school committee member. Experience is not tantamount to uh, being too old uh, to serve on a committee. Uh, experience is what delivers results for students. If you were going to a doctor, you wouldn't want a doctor who was fresh out of medical school to do give, perform open heart surgery. You'd want a doctor with experience and training and education who knew what he was doing. Um, over the years, I've reviewed in excess of 25 budgets, either as a Ways and Means Committee member or as a school committee member. Uh, I've been involved in multiple school renovation projects. Uh, I've been advocating for students for over 24, year, for 24 years on the school committee, and um, I get results. As I said earlier, I was instrumental in getting the accommodated uh, budget set up so that our out-of-district placement students uh, would have proper funding and proper transportation over the years. Uh, I've advocated increases in staffing. We have multiple needs right now uh, for uh, our children with learning issues. We need to get more instructional assistance and we need to get um, additional nurses as soon as possible to meet those needs. Um, as I said, I've served on other town budgets, uh, town um, committees over the years, and 
in closing, I, I, I said right from the outset, student mental health is one of the most important issues that the school committee is facing. Uh, we need to make sure that we have proper supports in place uh, going forward. Uh, we need somebody who's got experience and understands the issues. Um, and we need someone who knows how to address those issues properly. The role of a school committee member is primarily to ad advocate for proper funding for the running of the school system, to hire superintendents, uh, and to set policies. The school committee members are not charged by law in Massachusetts with micromanaging the, um, oh, the administration. Seconds. We rely on experts, as uh, individuals have said earlier tonight, we rely on experts, we hire good administrators, and we, we monitor how they, how they perform, we evaluate how they perform, and I think in our case, this committee has one of the best superintendents uh, in the country. Thank you. Closing statements, Catherine Bond. So um, I will kind of mirror some of what you were just saying. The job of the school committee is to select or terminate the superintendent, review and approve budgets, um, and establish educational goals and policies. And if elected, I will adhere to those uh, guidelines. Again, as far as experience, um, I've served on the BHS School Council for the last four, four years, which has given me a, a unique um, you know, experience in terms of being able to uh, communicate back and forth between the principal and the guidance department. Uh, as far as my business experience, I uh, was a business development manager prior to working for Raytheon, which exposed me to uh, proposals and contracts. Uh, you know, the finance side, of course, uh, being treasurer for the Winchester Figure Skating Club, and then other leadership roles, of course, would be the other board of directors that I've served on. If, um, so my goal really is to ensure that we educate and support all of our students as we move, they move from um, each level. And we can facilitate this by ensuring that our teachers um, get the support that they need uh, through attending seminars, uh, providing um, them the right support, um, and tools for trading. We need to continue to support inclusion of all of our students and to create a culture of kindness. We also need to be fiscally responsible when we create budgets. Current studies, as I've mentioned earlier, um, you know, our students are stressed. We need to continue to evaluate the situation. Um, <clears throat> ensure our students uh, that are at risk get the support that they need and that we need to make sure our students have the right support and training for these at-risk students if they ask for help. I would also like to thank the town meeting for all of the support of the schools, especially for their financial support. I look forward to continue the great relationship between the school committee, the board of selectmen, the town administrator, the financial teams, and all of the town employees. I believe I'm the best new person for the open seat because of an, I'm an involved parent of a recent graduate and I do have a broad understanding of experience of K through 12 and beyond. My goal is to protect your children. I said I want to provide the best possible education for your child and for every child we serve. I ask for your consider, uh, to consider casting one vote of your two of school committee votes for me on April 4th. Thank you. Thank you very much. And finally, Kyle Foss, your closing statements. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I'd like to thank BCAT for hosting us tonight. Alan, thank you for moderating. Uh, Melissa, Chris, and Rich, thanks for the great questions. And my fellow candidates, thank you for, as, uh, as past history has shown, some great debates um, for school committee. Um, I'm very happy that it's a contested race this year, not because it's more work for any of us and myself, but because it gives the voters of town a healthy choice and um, some ideas. You know, the, we, the contested election makes us debate these ideas and talk about the things that are important for schools and for our children. Um, I'm going to circle back to what I said at the beginning. Um, the, my life experiences uh, make me a, the best candidate for school committee this cycle. Um, as a father, again, I have a personal interest in continuing to make sure that the schools in Burlington are the positive, the productive places that we have come to know. As a teacher, um, I have the insights on the trends and issues that face schools every day, the struggles that teachers go through, the uh, problems that administration has to deal with, the, um, just the day-to-day -day operations of schools. I'm familiar with that world, and I can be a, an advocate for the professionals that work in our school district. As a town meeting member, I um, can bridge that gap as well, bringing the perspective of the budget cycle, of listening to the budget presentations, 
and making the decisions um, as the town meeting body to um, approve the budget uh, of the schools. It is a significant portion of the town budget and um, the one of the three roles of the school committee is to approve that budget and I believe I can make a um, be, bring a fresh voice and a strong voice to that process. Um, the other two parts of the school committee uh, responsibilities are to um, hire the superintendent. I think Dr. Conti is doing a great job and I support his and in his administration's efforts um, and to set policy again with my education background. Um, I um, feel I can bring a strong voice to uh, making sure that the policies of the Burlington schools continue to uh, move upward and onward. Um, I will close by saying uh, my duty as a civics teacher, the deadline to register to vote is tomorrow, so make sure you get down to town hall and make sure you're registered if you aren't already. I humbly ask for one of your votes on April 4th, and I, uh, thank you again. Good night. Great. Well, we've reached the end of the uh, discussions. In closing, I thank all four of the candidates, Stephen Nelson, Catherine Bond, Kyle Foss, and Adam Sinesi, not only for sharing their vision with the people of Burlington, but also for offering their time and service to the town. Thank you, Melissa Russell of the Burlington Union, and Chris Huffaker of the Burlington Patch, and Rich Hosford of B News. And finally, thank you to Jen Dodge and all of the, uh, the crew and volunteers here at BCAP. Remember, Election Day is Saturday, April 4th. The polls at the high school are open until 8 p.m. Here's your chance to have a say in how your town is governed. Make sure you take advantage of that. Don't pass it up. Get out and vote. Welcome to the special COVID-19 School Committee election update. I'm B News Director Rich Hosford and I'll be moderating. With schools closed down for the rest of the academic year and questions hanging over what the fall may bring, we thought it was important to hear from the four candidates for the two open seats on the school committee that voters will have to choose among in the June 6th Burlington Town election. They have graciously agreed to participate in this new style of communication we are all dealing with these days, video conference. So I'm so on the line, I'm joined by incumbent Stephen Nelson and newcomers Catherine Bond, Carl Foss, and Adam Senesi. Welcome to you all. This evening, we are going to keep things short and to the point. I'm going to ask the candidates two questions about the current situation and their thoughts on the role of the school committee to address it. The order they are going to respond to has been generated by the website random.org in our attempt to keep everything as fair as possible. So let's get started. The first question, which will go to Steve first, is what do you see as the role of the school committee during this situation? Well, thank you, Rich. Uh, that's an excellent question. It's, we're kind of uh, delving in uncharted waters here with uh, remote learning. I think the role of the school committee is to uh, monitor the, the progress uh, of remote learning as we try and implement um, not only support uh, instruction, but also implementing uh, new instruction. And one of the things that the superintendent did today, which I was strongly in favor of, was to send out a questionnaire to all the parents so that we can get parent input on their experiences, how remote learning is going in their households, what recommendations they might have for improvement, and just to, just to share with them uh, what, we're, what we're trying to accomplish and to find out how their children are adjusting to this, uh, this new way of, of learning. And uh, we hope to get the results of that survey back uh, sometime next week and to have uh, a forum at, at uh, our school committee meeting in June uh, to, to analyze that input and to see what steps we can take to make the online learning process uh, work even, even better. Uh, so uh, I think that's the role of the school committee, to try to make sure that we continue to develop the, the online learning programs uh, and to uh, analyze how they're, how they're going and to try to find ways to make them even better. Excellent. And now, same question to Adam. Uh, would you like me to repeat it? Uh, no, I understand the question. So I think there's a few different things that right now the school committee 
should be doing and is doing on some level. Um, first, yes, we need we need to help roll out the distance learning plan. We're in to, we're deep into the phases at this point, and it's it's been a mixed bag. I think it's a good dry run for next year, but it just it needs a tremendous level of improvement. My understanding from talking to the teachers is that there hasn't been a lot of direction from above, and there hasn't been much of in the way of a chain of command. I hear with great frequency throughout the to, throughout the campaign trail, I've heard a lot of the candidates say, well, we've got this, certain jobs that we do, including we hire a superintendent or fire a superintendent. Well, I think those are two extremes. I think there's somewhere in the middle that requires managing a superintendent. And when I'm finding out as a candidate from teachers in the system that they're not getting information from above, that needs to be ironed out a little bit. My understanding is when they rolled out phase three, they asked for clarification of what that would look like from the administration. They were told they would receive that and did not. We, the teachers are working far too hard. This isn't the teacher's fault. And this is no one's fault. Nobody wanted this. But we need to roll out, we need to improve on distance learning so that next year, if we need to go back into this mode, we can pull a plan out of a drawer and be ready to go with it. In the meantime, we need to be planning and budgeting for next year. That is something the school committee is doing. I think every bit of infrastructure spending that does not go towards instruction, safety, or, or a piece of equipment that is at the end of its useful life, if we're overspending in other areas that are nice to have, I look at further down the line that those could be jobs, and we want to save jobs. So for example, the football field that has not been taken off the docket yet for half a million dollars, that's five to seven jobs right there. Just get that off of the docket. That, don't even bring that to town meeting. Um, outside of that, I think we also need to be planning as to, I think our plan A should be putting the students back into the classroom next year. And we need to be ready and flexible for what that's gonna look like. Okay, yep. right. um, Same question, uh, Carl, would you like me to repeat it? Uh, no, thank you. Thank you, Rich. I <clears throat> appreciate the opportunity tonight. And um, as far as the, the role of the school committee, uh, one aspect that I see is that of kind of a conduit and a sounding board for every stakeholder that is involved in the process. I was very glad to see the parent survey that went out today, and I was also very glad to uh, learn about the uh, forum that's going to be coming up, and um, I hope it happens as soon as possible. Um, one thing about the survey that I was disappointed to learn is that it did not include the um, soliciting feedback from families with students that have out-of-district placement. I think that their um, experience with distance learning um, is important as well. Um, there are lessons to be learned from the programs that these students are in, and I think that at this point in the game, um, any information that we can solicit um, from whatever the source uh, can be valuable. <clears throat> so. Um, going back to the to kind of the conduit of information, I think the school committee um, can really use the information that they gather from all these stakeholders, from the parents. Um, I am hopeful that the administration and um, Dr. Conti and as, as well as the principals will solicit information from teachers um, as well as students, especially students at the middle and high school level. Um, they're the ones that have to be the most independent um, in this distance learning format and uh, their feedback is, is critical as well. Um, all this feedback, I, and, um, all this feedback that we gather, um, I'm hopeful that it is kind of distilled down and analyzed and the plans that we make moving forward over the next three months are um, reflective of the voices of all the stakeholders involved, parents, students, teachers, um, everybody has been thrust into this role, excuse me, and um, you know, everybody's making it up as they go along. And so as we um, move forward, we need to make sure that uh, everybody's voice is heard. The school committee can play a big role in that. Thanks. Excellent, thank you. And Catherine? <laughs> thank you. Um, so again, a lot's been said, but I think that the role of the school committee is going to, you know, again, listen to the teachers, the parents, and the students and uh, you know, figure out what needs to be done to improve the distance learning within the DESE um, requirements. 
Um, I spoke to, um, I, I was proactive in contacting the uh, school committee this week and asked them to allow parents to speak at one of the uh, upcoming meetings, hoping it will be the next one or the one after. Again, it was from uh, speaking to parents and from you know, looking at what's been going on social media. I felt that um, you know, there's really a need uh, for the uh, parents and you know, even students and teachers to be able to approach the school committee and you know, talk about their ideas and discuss what's working and what's not working. Um, I'm, you know, I requested that before I knew the survey was going out. Um, I also think that you know, the school committee needs to look at the big picture. Um, you know, some of it that we are, you know, really don't know is what is the school year going to look like next year. Um, I talked to uh, Dr. Conti, and my understanding is the Department of Health uh, is going to set the guidelines as far as what the classrooms are going to look like. We really have no idea. And then once those guidelines are set, um, then, you know, DESE is going to roll out their guidelines sometime in mid-June. And uh, then at that point, the uh, school committee is uh, going to have to, you know, meet as they normally do over the summer, um, but probably more often um, than usual in order to figure out what they're going to do. Um, we need to talk about budgeting. There are going to be increased costs in um, cleaning. Um, are we going to supply masks or not? Or we need to have them uh, in case, you know, kids bring their own and lose them. Um, my understanding, too, is that there will need to be two nurses on site. Um, one is going to be considered to be put in a clean room. And then the other one is going to handle the normal day-to-day uh, -day nursing activities. So there's a lot for us to think about um, in terms of what the future is going to look like uh, as far as the school committee is concerned. And again, um, I think it's important to get the input from everybody once we get all those guidelines so we put everything together as best as possible. Excellent, thank you. All right, halfway done. Um, the second question, which is gonna go to Adam first, is give me an idea you have on how to improve remote learning based on concerns you've heard from parents, educators, or students. Well, so I guess right off the top is we, we had said that one of the biggest issues was the chain, of, the internal chain of command in the district. So right off the top, I think that there should be a greater level of leadership from the top. From there, I think that what a curriculum should be composed of is it, is it should be clear, concise, and linear. And it should come with some measurable benchmarks for learning. And I, I really haven't seen that from this, from this program so far. It's been very scattered. I, I can see that with my own child, that every, no two days look alike. I know a lot of it's supposed to be around asynchronous learning, which they can do in their own time. But they do have these classroom sessions, too, that, you know, they're great because they get to see their peers and they get to see their teachers. But they sort of pop up out of the blue. I get I get the email on Sunday night saying this is what the week looks like, and now I'm scrambling to schedule my own meetings around it. Um, it's, it's obviously not a lot uh, all about the parents, it's not all about the students, but it's a fine line. And this the program is 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 just way too stressful on everybody, and including the teachers. The teachers are spinning their wheels way too hard and and not getting the the work satisfaction that they deserve. I've talked to teachers that are questioning their choice of profession at this point. And we truly are all in this together because, you know, in every household, we're all fighting some sort of struggle. But um, the teachers are right there with us. I've watched the teachers on their Zoom meetings. Will their own children nip at their heels the same way that I do when I'm on my Zoom meetings with, for my profession. So I just think having a more concise and well-organized curriculum that there were benchmarks for improvement. That's the way to go. Okay. And same question and going to Catherine now. Yeah, so um, again, you know, my understanding is that there um, is a five minute meeting that takes place every day uh, with the teachers. Um, it's a virtual meeting where they can discuss what's working and not working. And that's communicated um, with the uh, superintendent, superintendent of the schools and the principals and whatnot. So they um, are doing some sort of a daily meeting with the teachers. Um, I also know that um, they are, uh, you know, there are guidelines in terms of what is required of the teachers. I believe it's um, two hours per week um, 
you know, that they're required uh, to, to uh, you know, meet with the students, because uh, every teacher has a different situation. Some of them may have parents that they're taking care of. They may have kids of their own. Um, there is, um, I think it's, um, three hours of content per day. Um, so it's a combination, I believe, of pre-recorded um, teaching and then also the teachers are doing another recording of their own to supplement that. So, I mean, I, I believe they have been given direction, but that doesn't mean that there isn't room for improvement. I, there's a huge variety um, of, you know, what you could call superstar teachers who, you know, if you're a parent who has multiple kids in one household, you'll see, you know, what might be considered a superstar teacher. And then you've got other teachers who, again, are following um, and doing the best that they can based on, um, you know, what's provided to them, but there might be a perception that um, they're not doing as much or there's some inconsistency. And I think that inconsistency might be uh, due to the fact of their household situation. Um, if again, you have parents that are uh, comparing everything. I think what we need to do though is learn uh, from what's going on right now and um, listen to, again, listen to the parents, listen to the teachers. And I also feel it's important to get the, the students involved because they have a totally different perspective on what's working for them. And uh, I just think that, um, you know, we should, you know, take a look at that, get together and find what works best. I think we need to have the right venue um, and listen and adjust. Excellent. Uh, thank you. And same question. And now to uh, Steve. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, the question is, do I have ideas about how to improve remote learning? I think remote learning uh, is improving week by week. I think it's a new adventure for, for teachers. I think they're learning how to collaborate with one another and to produce um, new lessons. Uh, we have something called a choice board. And the choice board is an area where uh, our specialists can create lessons. And apparently when we started this process just six or seven weeks ago, uh, I think there was something like 200 uh, lessons on the choice board. And there's over 700 lessons now on the choice board. So that's an example of the specialists designing lessons to try to streamline what the teachers have to do uh, in their own homes in terms of designing lessons. So the teachers are sharing uh, these lessons and not every one of them is reinventing uh, reinventing the wheel, so to speak. So I think that that's good. The, the increase in collaboration is really important. I think teachers are getting better at it. It's been kind of a uh, an experiment that a lot of teachers were not, uh, you know, terribly skilled at when they first started and they're developing their skills day by day by, by all of the collaboration that's been going on. So I think that that's really important. I agree with the, the other um, speakers that talk about getting input from parents and students. Um, we have to hear from students as well because uh, their input is, is, is extremely valuable. Uh, I know that teachers are getting input from students now because they're, they're interacting with students. They're having uh, uh, sessions once or twice a week where they, where they just talk with their students one-on-one, -on -one, get input from them. So it's not like the teachers aren't hearing from the students. I think that they are hearing from the students. I think, but it's important for the, that information to get passed up the line to the school committee uh, so that we hear what, uh, what the students' concerns are and maybe we can assist uh, the administration uh, in designing uh, programming that addresses those needs. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. And finally, um, Carl, do you need me to repeat the question? Please. Okay, um, it says, the question is, give me an idea you have on how to improve remote learning based on the concerns you've heard from parents, educators, or students. Okay, great. <clears throat> uh, the, the suggestion that I would make um, to improve remote learning can be summed up in one word, and that's flexibility. Um, this whole distance learning program since the school closure on March 13th has been a uh, scramble to fill the void. And... Uh, Parents have been thrust into the role of homeschool teacher. Teachers have been trying to uh, modify their in-person curriculum to fit a distance learning model. And um, administrators have been trying to support both teachers and parents. And the entire process has been trying to, is like trying to fit a uh, square peg into a round hole. And so I think that going forward, the, the name of the game is gonna be flexibility. We need to, really have a long conversation about what we want learning to look like and 
when Adam had mentioned asynchronous learning, that is a fantastic idea, especially at the middle and high school level. Um, students are able to complete their assignments um, on their own time. I know a lot of the middle school students that I teach, they have become almost nocturnal where they're sleeping all day and staying up all night. Um, and I think the same is true for a lot of the older students. Um, younger students, they still need a lot of handholding when it comes to distance learning. Um, the sad fact is that we're gonna have some form of it in the fall, it's, it seems pretty certain. Um, I mean, so we're still hoping for an on-time opening, but um, it's looking less and less likely. So the name of the game is flexibility. The teachers need to have more training on how to properly implement distance learning. Um, that is a big suggestion um, that I would make. And um, again, the flexibility to allow teachers to uh, adapt their curriculum properly for distance learning, the flexibility to allow families to um, fit the distance learning into the schedule that works for them. A lot of them are working from home or if they're an essential worker, they um, don't have a ton of time. So the, um, the adding that flexibility would be um, the key. Thanks. Excellent, thank you. Thank you all. Um, so there you have it, our COVID-19 themed school committee candidate forum update. I'd like to thank all the candidates for participating and all of you for watching. As a reminder, the town election is on Saturday, June 6th, and the polls will be open in the high school gymnasium from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Due to the current situation, you can also request either an absentee or early voting ballot uh, to mail to the town clerk's office. You can find all the information you need for that at the town website at burlington.org. Stay safe, and we'll see you on election night with all the results. Thank you. Stay safe, everyone. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you, Rich. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.